Uh, first of all, good evening to everyone who's here. Uh, good evening to our first timers and uh, thank you to everyone who's been attending in the last three weeks. Uh, you're more than welcome. Um, this is our third talk in our Wellness RX series. Uh, I'd like to thank Surge Q8 for uh, allowing me to you know, broadcast this lecture series through their platform. And uh, we have two special guests tonight as we delve into the third part of our wellness, uh, which is our physiotherapy. Uh, our first guest this evening is Dr. Salman Al-Sabah, who is the chairman of surgery at Jabir Lahman Hospital. He's also currently the president of the Kuwait Association of Surgeons, as well as the governor of the American College of Surgeons. Our second guest this evening is Nikolai Stempel, uh, who is a physiotherapist at Fusion 5 Performance Center in Germany. Uh, he specializes in rehabilitation prevention and performance management. Mm -hmm. uh, along the many years he's been working, he's has a lot of experience treating professional athletes as well as uh, regular day-to-day -day, uh, workers like all of us. Um, we'll start our first part of the talk with Dr. Salman al-Sabah um, and the floor is yours, Dr. Salman. Yes, good evening. And uh, thank you, Engineer Osama Awaj for uh, the invitation. And uh, I'd like to start with, uh, to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the friends and colleagues who are working behind this platform and having all these series, especially the wellness series, which is, I think it's a really important topic that we need to focus on to prevent uh, injuries and uh, uh, work-related injuries, especially. And uh, so we can keep our uh, specialist surgeons and the physicians and any healthcare provider in, in a good shape so they can deliver the best care to their patients. I would like to share my presentation. We're going to start, I'm going to talk about uh, musculoskeletal injuries related to surgeons and specifically, but also this could be looked at from a physician's point of view as well in general, as it's not just uh, for surgeons. Uh, also, I'm going to discuss uh, our study that we conducted here in Kuwait using uh, uh, web-based surveys looking at uh, different surgeons, especially bariatric surgeons around the world uh, to look into, uh, into more about musculoskeletal injuries. Now, these are my disclosures, none of those related to this talk. Ergonomics for surgeon. I think the word ergonomics is an important uh, word that we need to understand. So uh, it comes from Greek roots and uh, basically it's a science behind anatomy, physiology, psychology, engineering in a system approach to make the operating room and the performance of the operation favorable for the so uh, it has multiple divisions from different perspectives, such as physical, cognitive, organization. And if you look at the operating room, uh, there's multiple factors that are important that you have to consider to, to make sure that you have good ergonomics and prevent injuries, such as visualization, manipulation, posture, and mental uh, thoughts. Now, this is a publication in 2017, which raised an important matter, which is that surgeon knowledge for the definition and practice of ergonomics is really low, it's 11%. So all 11% understand ergonomics and how it works. Uh, and that's really uh, an alarming uh, number. For example, so if you, you are a laparoscopic surgeon and you're operating, you can see from this uh, image that when you operate, when you look at the monitor in front of you, it's important to know the distance between you and the monitor. Uh, and many studies that suggest around uh, one meter distance. And also, of course, that depends on the size of the screen. And uh, the bigger the size, you can go further, but that's uh, a basic knowledge. And also you have to make sure that your eye level is on the top of the monitor. And that's really important. Uh, many surgeons, if you go to the operating room, you will see them doing what's in the second uh, picture down there. And uh, basically this is really important. And that's important, why? Because it will prevent uh, uh, neck, shoulder, back injuries to the surgeon. So, and this was not taught in, in, in our medical school. I remember in my medical school, even in my residency, they were not discussing ergonomics. And I think it's really important to do that. And so we can have a better uh, career and less injuries in future. The other thing you need to know also when you, you know, you have to know 
the table uh, height, where is the optimal height for the surgeon? For example, if you're doing laparoscopy, then the ports on the belly of the uh, patient, for example, should be at your pubic level. And your hand should be 90 to 120 degrees, exactly as the picture. And the distance between you and the screen is around one meter and, or three to four feet. And the degrees, your vision should be 10 to 20 degrees. So you have to make sure that 10 to 20 degrees from the middle of the monitor. So this is how you have to stand. Of course, you make sure that you have to flex your knees so you don't get injured. And you have to have sometimes a mattress if your OR have that, that prevent uh, uh, a lot of injuries uh, because of the solid uh, floor. Now, elbow height, the elbow height is really important, especially for open surgery. And uh, what we say is the elbow should be at the level of the uh, operating table surface. And uh, why we're doing all that? To prevent uh, injuries to your back, to your neck, to your shoulder, that if you do it, if you don't do it right, from the beginning, it will be a habit that you don't have a good posture. And that means with more uh, surgeries, you will have more wear and tear and more injuries and so on, and less uh, length of your career. Of course, we are all, yes, physicians and surgeons, but we also have, you know, work, especially in this era with COVID-19 epidemic, we're using, you know, such as Zoom platforms. And we have also, we, we do all of our work nowadays, 90%, maybe uh, non-physicians or non-health providers do it from home. And, and really important that for you and your family, that you know how to uh, make sure that when you look at the computer and your uh, desktop, uh, how you have this taken care of. So make sure that the elbow is supported, the keyboard is the of your elbow, making sure that your vision uh, is, is your eyes looking at the top of the uh, monitor and then the computer's flicks a little bit so that the bottom part is more towards you. This is a basic important things that should be taken care of to prevent injury. So what's the benefit of ergonomics, especially to surgeons? So reduction of injury and illness, reduction of missed operating time, reduction in errors that could happen because of the uh, injuries that you have, reduction in burnout. And burnout, it's a big topic. I, I will not touch into details about that. That needs another uh, lecture. Reduction in, in your career time. And, and, and that's why I'm, this is an important topic that we need to focus on and make sure that it's in our curriculum, uh, whether it's medical school or residency training. We know that stress and fatigue uh, from your training as a resident uh, through your practice as well, it has also implications on your, uh, on your body in terms of injuries. Stress is well connected to more uh, injuries and more exhaustion and, and, and damage to your, your, your body. Now, we know that around 28% of physicians are above the threshold of the usual or, or the general. Uh, so that means uh, we are at a higher risk of those injuries because we have a higher risk of stress level compared to the normal population, 28%. Now, surgical ergonomics interventions are not formally taught, as I said earlier, in our programs. That's why we have this series as a start, as a seed, so we can think of how to implement this kind of uh, 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 education in our curriculums. In terms of uh, uh, habits, I think that's another issue. That's why it's important we start early about uh, training and how we can understand ergonomics well and what's the right posture to prevent injuries. Now, as a physician, we have a pledge, and which is the oath that all physicians around the world that, uh, you know, uh, adhere to it. So the last one was in October 2017, but this is started in 1948, the first pledge or oath, and it's been modified with time, amended with time. And why I'm saying that, because the most recent one I highlighted to you as a physician that I will attend to my own health for the first time that they mentioned that well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. So for the first time, wellness comes into the oath of physicians and that, you know, empower the importance of uh, uh, 
taking care of your body, making sure that you understand how to prevent your practice. And what's new about this pledge that happened in 2017 in Chicago is that they added four important points to the previous pledge, which is, or oath, respect for patient autonomy. So that's an important fact that was been added. So shared decisions, but not to diminish uh, conscience, meaning that it have, making sure that you have a good feeling about it and making sure that it doesn't you know, uh, go against that. To share information in teaching or publication and give respect to teachers, colleagues, and students. That was added, as well as to exercise the profession according to standards of medicine and to care for your own health. So I'm gonna highlight that again, because these are the important points that were being added to uh, the oath that was being uh, uh, agreed on in general assembly and by the World Organization of Medical Association in 2017. So if you talk about surgeons and laparoscopic surgery by itself, there is report saying that 73 to 88% of surgeons who does laparoscopic surgery specifically have uh, physical complaints and injuries, and which is really high number. Now, if you look at the study published at the Annals of Surgery, a review showed that, confirmed that percentage, which is 73 to 88%. And this is a study that we published in 2019, uh, last year, in surgical endoscopy one of the most important uh, journals in, in, in laparoscopy. So the prevalence of musculoskeletal injuries among bariatric surgeons. Uh, and this is important because bariatric patients, so, uh, so people living with obesity, when you operate those patients, there's a lot of challenges because of the body habitus, how you position your port, how you do your surgery, how you position the table. And sometimes the equipment that we have internationally will not help us to get the best ergonomics in these cases. So we did the study and uh, unfortunately that many surgeons who does bariatric surgery specifically from all, all around the world, these are the countries who are involved in our study, uh, surgeons from th these countries. Basically what we showed that, you know, we looked into details of demographics and showed that the, the mean age was 45 and majority were uh, males. And you know, the average height was 175 centimeters, weight 83, BMI 27, and uh, years in practice. So they have experience 20 years. So those, you know, they have a good amount of experience. And the glove size was 7.4. The glove size is important, especially in the public survey, because we know anything below six, the instruments that have been created are not made for that. So uh, that's why we have to think about how we innovate our instrument to fit the people with uh, even uh, smaller gloves or specifically even females. Now we, are, we know our programs, are have, we are having more uh, female surgeons joining, which, which means we have to rethink about the instrument's size and, and ergonomics to make sure that they don't get injury. Because I will show you down in the study that we showed uh, female surgeons have more injuries than males and probably most likely because of the instrument design. Uh, majority of those patients are, uh, of those surgeons uh, work in an academic center, private and government. So private has the highest, of course, bariatric surgeons, many of those surgeons do private practice and uh, they have experience in open. Some of them have experience in and robotic surgery as well. So, and this uh, uh, cohort has, they have experience in open, laparoscopy and robotic. Types of procedures, majority of sleep gastrectomy in the study. And if you look at uh, numbers of hours, most of those surgery uh, durations are about one to three hours in, for bariatric procedures itself. And you can see that 66% uh, of those surgeons have complaint of pain and discomfort uh, with bariatric surgery or in labros with laparoscopy surgery as, as a whole. Now, uh, and around 30% of those have pain, they found that this affected their performance and they reduced the load of 
uh, having uh, doing more surgery. So they reduce the load because of the pain that they have. Now, if you look at uh, what they went through, they went through of those x-rays multiple of, uh, of those imaging because of that kind of pain and around uh, uh, 50, 60 percent almost required treatment so 60 percent of those bariatric surgery required treatment whether it's medical or physical therapy or surgical if you look at the six percent 6.4 percent required surgery uh, because of their injuries tells you the magnitude of those uh, uh, and, and the importance of ergonomics and physical health and uh, you can see most of those uh, with the open surgery, we found that mostly the pain is in the back and neck, while in laparoscopy, you can see it mostly in the uh, shoulders and back. Robotics, you can see more with the neck because in the robot, you're sitting in a console and your neck is uh, flexed or extended depending on the position. That's why it's very important. Even, in, in, even if you do robotics, they will teach you how to do ergonomics to prevent such uh, problems. I, I told you earlier that females had, have reported more pain in the neck and back and shoulder area. And uh, there are many reasons behind that, whether the, the, the height uh, of, the, of the surgeon, the, the, the instrument itself, the, the, there are bigger instruments on their hands and so on. So I'm gonna move on these. You can see that many of those uh, surgeons required uh, CT scans, MRI, uh, on a frequent basis because of this kind of pain, which happened in almost 60% of them. To summarize the study, we know that 66% of our surgeons in this uh, study experience uh, pain and discomfort due to uh, surgical reasons. And 27%, they decreased their surgical load, which means it will reflect on their experience, it will reflect on their income as well. And 30% percent it and performance in surgery so one third of those surgeons because of that pain they, it affects their performance and we again the females have higher uh, percentage of pain so that's why we need to revisit uh, maybe they need uh, to revisit the instrument the exercise and so on we need to that's a different uh, talk uh, we know that you know supine position so when you do surgery but surgery we have two positions whether it's supine or we work uh, in French position. Now, supine position causes more uh, discomfort in the wrist, but the other position causes more in the back. So it's really important to understand each position and how it will affect your performance and, and also uh, injury as well. Uh, we know that uh, many of 50%, 57% required medical treatment. And as I, as I told you earlier, 6.5% required surgery. Uh, but the pay to do either back surgery because of uh, their work. So to conclude, uh, musculoskeletal injuries are uh, really uh, common among uh, surgeons and has, it affects the surgeon uh, capabilities at work and the, from, in terms of performance. I think that it's very important that we raise uh, awareness about this issue. And so we, we can have uh, surgeons with less pain and less uh, career effect in terms of they could not uh, move in their career because of that uh, injury that happened to them. And I, I think that uh, engineer Osama, you know, touched on the right topic because uh, we, as a surgeon, I'm, I'm one of them. And uh, even if we have pain, we keep working and we don't discuss this. We think this is part of our life. And this is the way we were trained. We don't, we, you know, we take pain. We, our programs were, were made us, you know, uh, we think in, uh, have implication on us and uh, we're gonna have injuries and that will affect us, uh, uh, affect our future. And especially there's a lot of need for surgeons around the world. Uh, in, in the US in 2025, there is the need of 25,000 surgeons. Uh, so even here in Kuwait, even everyone, well, there is a need for surgeons. And if we have the surgeon's career shortened, that has its own implication as well. So it's an important topic. We need to focus more. We need to do more research about it. And also we need to exercise and uh, do uh, understand ergonomics very well to prevent uh, any injuries in the future. 
Now, this is the last slide. I got it from the Women Surgeon Society. Who basically says work-life balance does not exist. You can have it all, but not at the same time. All right. So, so you have to we have to access matters. Uh, uh, make sure that you understand. Uh, you know that we live in a very uh, uh, stressful uh, job. That uh, that will add to the injuries. That might that will increase the chances of injury. And so we make sure that you have really good work-life balance. Make sure uh, you exercise. You make sure that you understand the ergonomics and the engineering part of the operating room and to prevent injuries. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you and I look forward for your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salman. Uh, thank you for bringing, uh, you know, putting the spotlight on such frightening numbers, I think, with surgeons. I think if we look at different uh, sectors within the uh, healthcare workers, maybe dentists and all, we'll probably see such alarming numbers. Um, and uh, now uh, we'll move on to uh, Nik Nico, Nikolai, who will um, give us some practical solutions to these alarming numbers and how we can battle this and bulletproof our body, as we say. Thank you. So, Okay. Can you see everything? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, um, I uh, really appreciate that um, I can be Uppsala, that I really appreciate to be here with you guys um, and to present some of my knowledge and experiences on movement and musculoskeletal discomforts. Um, yeah, who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Nikolai Stempel and I'm a physiotherapist from Germany. And I got in connection with Osama almost one year ago uh, when he hit me up on my Instagram because uh, he got aware of the work I'm doing nationally and internationally with my colleagues at Fusion 5 Performance. Um, at Fusion 5, we are a team of athletic trainers, mental coaches, nutritionists and physiotherapists and we all share one goal to take you to the next level. And uh, we want to unlock undiscovered potential, strengthen you after an injury, and at the same time, minimize the risk for future injury. We are sure that we will um, accomplish this goal with you by applying our five pillars of optimal health and performance. That's why we are called Fusion 5. And these pillars consist of therapy. Um, we try to improve the capacity of your physical structures and try to restore the right functions. Um, for training, uh, where we try to optimize functional movements to support the needs of your life. The mental coaching part, um, where our coaches try to align the subconscious and conscious goals with one another for mental focus on success. Our nutrition coaches, our nutritionists, um, yeah, they try to support your body with, uh, with the right nutrients and try to teach you how to recover and perform better with foods and um, yeah that we try um, to specifically try to put a focus on whole foods and uh, mainly plant-based diets and our fourth uh, fifth pillar is uh, the biohacking we try to use technology um, like a crow sauna for example as well as building daily routines with our athletes athletes including breathing techniques cold showers and meditations um, I personally became a physiotherapist because I wanted to help um, and to guideline human beings to become the best version of themselves and whatever this might be from the goal from achieving high performance in sports or business to living a healthy, active and pain-free life with your family. And I believe in the self-efficacy uh, in every single person I meet. The gap between the demands of the human body and the capacity is becoming, the capacity is, it has becomes bigger and bigger. And therefore many people get out of balance and develop acute and or chronic aches and pain. Now I want to provide guidance and will outline some possibilities how to start with this for yourself. Um, my expertise within the therapy and the rehabilitative processes uh, and in the last years, I've spent a huge amount of time working with athletes on national and international level. 
And I started over at um, yeah, the Football Youth Academy for Fortuna Düsseldorf in the uh, under 19th and the second team, where my job was to make sure that all the injured players got uh, fit, uh, fit as soon as possible. And um, yeah, I escorted the teams to the games all over Germany. And um, yeah, we had exciting trips. So like you can see here on the pictures, we, we've been um, to uh, there over there in Canada. Um, then I went with uh, my Fusion 5, Fusion 5 team to um, Ibiza last year, where we had a summer camp to um, yeah, get all the athletes fit for the upcoming season. Um, yeah, at the same time, I, I started at um, Fortuna Dusseldorf. I started working with Fusion 5. And yeah, like I just said, there we try to focus on to the individualized approach to optimize health and performance of pro athletes. And as part of this, I uh, work on almost a daily basis with football players from the Bundesliga, Premier League, uh, the Super League, as well as uh, Olympic athletes from field hockey, badminton and many other sports. But since 2019, I abandoned my additional work at Fortuna Düsseldorf and now um, joined the field hockey team, which are currently the two times defending German champion. And uh, we're looking forward to get the next title next year. Uh, initially, Osama and I had the idea of me coming over to Kuwait this year to present some of our work and build up overseas relationships for optimal health. But yeah, as all of us know, in the first quarter, quarter of uh, this year, this tricky thing called COVID-19 got a little bit out of hand and uh, changed our lives since then. Therefore, I hope uh, all of you guys watching are healthy and safe, and I'll be happy to um, add some value to your evening today. So quick overview, um, I'm going to talk about the challenges in work life, ergonomics, posture, the term prehab, um, and give you some practicals at the end. And yeah, the challenges in work life, the status quo is um, that we have increasing demands, productivity and efficiency are uh, omnipresent and almost everyone in modern life can sense this during work. We have a 24 seven availability, um, yeah, which especially by, um, the invention of the internet a few years ago um, and quick and affordable international travel revolutionized the way how work can be done and virtually every service and information is available no matter the day or time which has a huge advantage in medicine business and private life of course but apart from this um, it also sets many of us in a state of constant alertness at least i Feel it like this and yeah this modern lifestyle leads to a maladjusted work-life balance um, that many of us i think experience so um i want to talk a little bit about, a little bit about potential stressors um i have like three big subgroups the environmental influences which could be something simple like uh, just an air conditioner or an uh, artificial light, which our bodies are constantly exposed to, um, which is stressing our body, as well as the physical stress to the musculoskeletal system. Um, yeah, with things like long and steady standing or sitting, um, which is a risk factor for developing musculoskeletal aches and pain, like Dr. Salmon just uh, pointed out um, during surgery, for example, yeah, so people have to stand a lot, sit a lot, stay in static um, positions, and this can be a risk factor. As well as lifting or carrying can increase the chance uh, for injury, especially if the individual is uh, not used to it or just unprepared. Then we have the mental stressors, um, like long day and night shifts and the absence of adequate breaks um, seem to have to become the new normal and have a huge impact on performance and accuracy during work. The consequences are um, yeah, insufficient nutrient supply. When there's less time available during work for breaks, the intake of food and hydration will suffer. Um, a mild hydration can already lead to poor concentration, uh, lack of concentration, <clears throat> um, increased reaction time, short-term memory problems and headaches and more. And this is definitely not something that we want to have. Um, as well, high stress on the immune system when the human body is exposed to stressors that chronically triggers the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for flight or flight, or fight or flight mode, the immune system could take a hit, resulting in higher chances for physical and psychological illnesses. Regarding mental stress and um, nutrition, there are two upcoming lectures in the next few weeks, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. And um, yeah, I 
just continue. <clears throat> okay, um, to start off a little bit more general, uh, I would like to present some statistics from the overall population. I guess almost everyone here will be aware of the fact that low back pain is the most common musculoskeletal condition worldwide with almost 85 of adults suffering from low back pain at some point in their life. And furthermore, low back pain is a huge cost factor to the healthcare systems, um, costing Americans almost 50 billion US dollar each year. And uh, this is um, high and high relevance as well to the productivity and efficiency in companies. To be a little bit more specific, I would like to have some numbers. Uh, Dr. Simon just uh, pointed out uh, from his study. I um, yeah, took his study for these um, numbers and statistics. Um, yeah, and he was able to show the prevalence, high prevalence of musculoskeletal pain in surgeons, especially bariatric surgeons. And uh, I think I can skip this now. <clears throat> Okay, another highlight, um, paper highlighted the 12 month pain prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders of healthcare providers and was able to show similar risks in developing musculoskeletal pain like high risk laborers. But not only, high, um, not only healthcare professionals um, suffer pain and strain during work, also up to 75% 75, 75 of people working in other jobs like office employees experience acute pain or chronic pain. Moreover, I can tell you from uh, my experience um, uh, with pro athletes that they also suffer from pain and aches. Um, now you could think of, of course, during, during and post high intensity sport, there's a high chance for developing some discomforts. But what if I tell you um, that I had to figure out that a high percentage of my athletes presenting with low or neck, low back or neck pain, I'll develop this during doing nothing. <laughs> Especially football players tend to have a little bit um, yeah, like a, a schedule which has a lot of time off, approximately six to eight hours a day. Um, and they like to spend a lot of this time um, on their mobile phones, the PlayStation or the TV. So basically they have days that are comparable to the ones um, of office employees regarding the amount of time spent sitting in unfavorable positions. So in consequence, they are also in risk for missing out days at work or injuring, them to, injuring themselves more badly as a result of high impact during a game on top of the already ailing condition. Okay, ergonomics. Um, let's be a little bit now uh, more precisely about this. Um, the definition I found um, with the scientific ergonomics is a scientific study of people and the working conditions, especially done in order to improve effectiveness. Uh, yeah, and here we can see <clears throat> two, two images of almost perfect ergonomics, uh, like Dr. Salman showed in his um, slides as well. And therefore, I think uh, I can skip this again. <clears throat> And here we have uh, some bad examples of um, ergonomics. There's some uh, yeah, two, two surgeons in action um, and an office employee uh, sitting at his desk in not the very best um, ergonomic positioning. And yeah, I think this classic round back forward head working posture, um, almost every one of uh, you watching, uh, even me, uh, caught themselves in accidentally. And it could be argued that this position stresses the dorsal ligaments and the muscles of the thoracic and cervical spine. But um, this position on general positions like this aren't that bad in the first run. So um, you don't have your worries. Um, there's no need to stress out if any one of you see themselves in that kind of posture now or remembers themselves uh, being in that posture. Because biome biomechanical abnormality abnormalities are actually normal. Um, there are a lot of papers, especially on the topic of non-specific back pain in correlation to posture and movement. Latest research indicates that we might consider the thing, what we might consider as a poor posture or unhealthy posture is not related to pain and disability. What seems to be of much greater importance is the amount of overall movement behavior. So now you have to reflect on yourself, how much and uh, in how many ways and forms uh, you move each day. 
in the following, uh, I have an example that might look shocking for, for the one another, but um, yeah, again, you don't need to stress out. Um, luckily, the human body is amazingly adaptable and can resist crazy amount of forces, especially when the load exposure is stretched over a longer period of time. This is what we call training effect. So it's not too late for you to change something and start with moving and consciously control your body more often. Otherwise pictures like the one you're seeing here uh, wouldn't be uh, possibly wouldn't, sorry, wouldn't be possible without injury. Um, despite this uh, picture is definitely not labeled ergonomic. Um, we can see here is a, um, he's a power lifter, one of the strongest power lifters of all times. Um, Lamar, that's his name, uh, he was able to lift more than five times his body weight. Um, and yeah, I think this is pretty impressive. <clears throat> okay, conclusively, what can we say? Um, I think ergonomics uh, make work more efficient and safe, but education is crucial on how to behave within the ergonomic adjustments. Ergonomic settings uh, are not a mandatory need uh, to work efficient and pain-free, but can also be a potential risk factor for decreasing self-awareness. When you rely on the ergonomic adjustments, um, I think the one or another um, won't think um, about what he's doing with his body in, in, in the special situation. Development of high tech um, like exoskeletons could be a future game changer for those professionals which are in need for ergonomic settings, but um, yet a universal implementation of this is uh, difficult. And here you can see uh, a surgeon <clears throat> with an exoskeleton which uh, provides uh, some support to, to, to his muscle, to, to the posture and relieves the muscle from excessive stress during work. Okay. Now, talking about posture, um, posture is the way in which someone usually holds their body, shoulders, neck and back, um, or a particular position in which someone stands or sits. When there's a question, is there a perfect posture? If yes, um, how should it look like? When you simply Google perfect posture, you'll immediately find uh, images like the ones you can see here. But um, yeah, where do these beliefs come from? That this actually, that this is the perfect posture. Maybe it's due to always being told to sit and stand up straight and not to slouch while parents <clears throat> from an early age on. Because of those beliefs, there are quite some questionable products you can spend your money on when you're around in the internet. Uh, for example, like these uh, posture trainers. Uh, these products aim to... Um, push the body passively into the position that is considered as correct and you just strap them on like a backpack and then uh, hope for, for a miraculously uh, thing to happen that the girdles correct your body into an upright torso position. Uh, humans uh, are always looking for shortcuts with minimal effort and yeah, luckily the body does not work like this and needs more than an external input to adapt. The human body works with the principle of use it or lose it. So this is something I'm confronted with on almost a daily basis in therapy. For example, if someone calls for my advice because of uh, back pain and they tell me that they've been experiencing this pain after, living, uh, after lifting heavy during um, house moving. My first question is always then, what, when did you lift heavy before the move? In 90% of the cases, the, pac the patient uh, cannot remember when, and the procedure is then in therapy to expose the human being to the stimulus they decompensated under in small doses and empower the person to use what he learned to unuse step by step again. So adaptability to the environment is key. Research shows that there's no such thing as the perfect cor or correct posture, but that differences in posture are effect of life and it's actually safe to adapt more and comfortable positions. So don't feel bad if you just slouch during this uh, lecture. <clears throat> okay, um, posture. To ensure that the body is adaptable to its environment, what I just um, stated, is um, that uh, the body needs to have certain capabilities. 
the body needs to have sufficient range of motion or flexibility for the task that needs to be done. Um, adequate control and coordination within the flexibility is needed as well. Enough stability and strength to control the range of motion in a repetitive way and to perform demanding task is crucial. And the fourth thing is a good body or cortical mapping. So that's why we can see the so-called homunculus. I think some of you will be aware of this. Um, the quality of movement and the perception of certain body parts is proportionate to the quality and size of the motor sensory maps of that body part. You can see this, like I said, in the, in the homunculus, um, where different body parts are represented um, in certain areas in the brain. Here you have the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. <clears throat> and uh, a study observed the organization of the somatosensory cortex in braille readers, so the people that read with the fingers on, on the paper that has some ups and downs. <clears throat> um, and it was shown that the recording of somatosensory evoked potentials in the index finger of braille readers compared to non-readers while using the reading finger was significantly larger. So findings like these let us suggest that if you have a very detailed map of certain areas, you can perceive and move those areas with precision. If the map is less trained or perceived blurry, the movement quality and sensation will suffer. Further evidence for the importance of cortical mapping can be found in chronic pain patients, especially low back pain patients who suffer reduced tactile acuity in the affected area, which is linked to somatosensory cortex modulation. So let's jump to the topic of prehab. Um, prehab is a concept employed by sports physiotherapists around the world with one simple goal, to prevent injuries but it is also a form of personalized risk assessment and exercise protocols designed to train the athlete to the maximum potential while reducing the chances of any unwanted injuries with potentially costing them their career span. For me personally, prehab is not ultimately limited to athletes. I see prehab as an urgent necessity for anyone, but especially for those that are undergoing ambitious lifestyles work in demanding jobs or simply seek to perform at the highest level every single day. Moreover, I would add the rehabilitation of recent injury and or aches and pain if existing to the definition. In the following, I want to highlight the most important aspects of the two terms that prehab is composed of. First, we have the prevention. Prevention is the act of stopping something or uh, from happening uh, the, act, the act of stopping something from happening or of stopping someone from doing something, sorry for that. Um, and when talking about prevention and how to keep somebody injury and pain free, it is crucial to assess the individual situation first and ask what is your body capable of and what does your body has to endure during everyday life. You need to know the factors which have an influence on the prevention goal you are shooting for. For example, when the goal is to build up muscle so you can stabilize your body for longer times during demanding tasks at your job, you have to think about what other factors have an influence on this. When you are a football pro, your job is about 60 to 180 minutes of, fo of football specific training per day. The rest of the day, you can basically do whatever you like. You can eat, sleep and rest whenever and for how long you want to and easily fit the prehab program into your day whenever suits your best. But when you're, for example, a physician with eight to 10 or even 12 to 24 hour shifts, there are not many spots left during the day to fit in your program. But working hours are not the only problem. As a consequence of those well-organized working days, there are limited opportunities for getting in food and hydration finding a rhythm for sleep and taking care of your family. All these aspects have a huge impact on how to structure the individual, individual's program. And basically we can say there's no one size fits all approach. As a real life example, I can give you a story from my daily work with athletes. I've spent 24 to 72 hours with different football players multiple times. And I'll allow myself to be able to judge a little bit about their daily routines. And um, of course, I'm not going to drop some of the names of my athletes, but maybe you can guess some. 
Um, the counterpart of the football player will be my girlfriend, who is currently in her last year of medical school during clinical, <clears throat> during, uh, clinical rotations. An ordinary day in the life of a Brazilian football player I was working with in Newcastle looked like this. He wakes up at about 9 to 10 in the morning, then gets in some breakfast. Uh, most times has then about three, four or five hours of free time. Um, has some training in the in the afternoon between 3 to 5 p.m., then dinner and uh, leisure time from 6 p.m. onwards. Sometimes there's a second training session of 60 to 90 minutes in between, but this is maybe once or two times a week, so not that often. So an ordinary uh, day in the life of my girlfriend, who's uh, yeah, a medical student, uh, looks like this. She wakes up at 5.45, uh, is having breakfast at around 6.15, then went to the hospital um, up to 4.30. Sometimes she gets lunch in between um, because like all of you know, if there's an emergency, you don't have time to eat lunch. Um, when she comes home, she's uh, studying again, uh, doing a thesis, uh, some household, getting groceries or whatever. And then there's sometimes a little bit of uh, time left for something like a prehab program because then there's still dinner, maybe some leisure time to enjoy and calm down. And then of course you have to sleep. <clears throat> so um, yeah, again, a little bit more in detail to the prevention thing. Um, prevention can be divided in, in, in two parts in the external and the internal prevention. And uh, the external prevention mostly includes factors that you have only limited control of. Regarding sports, it could be the rigidity of the pitch, the new shoes you're wearing, or environmental influences during a game. In work life, it could be something like adjusting the heights of the operation table, the, or the office desk, or the work gear or placement of monitors. The internal prevention focuses on your body's resilience to cope with the stress and the amount of resources that are available for any demands of life. From my experiences, I can tell you that the internal prevention should be the main form of um, prevention for different reasons. Um, first of all, it is the most controllable and individual tailorable form of prevention. Um, individual assessments can be made with, object with objective data like range of motion, strength and endurance. And the uh, individual prevention is within yourself. So you don't need to rely on technology or anything other than yourself. Second, um, optimization of internal prevention factors will also have a positive impact on your general quality of life. For example, if a strong lower back or great shoulder mobility is needed for your profession to excel, the strengthening of your back will also benefit you in private life. For example, playing with your kids, your dog, or just going for a spontaneous hike because you feel like it. And third, the internal prevention has long lasting effects. If you are able to move efficient, have your body in resilient shape and are able to cope with stress, it will have overall health benefits. Your musculoskeletal system will learn how to work proficiently, your cardiovascular system will adapt positively, and your body's ability to relax improves as well. So the second term of prehab, this is rehabilitation, of course. Um, you can see me uh, on the right um, doing our summer camp uh, in Ibiza where I was working with an athlete from the Bundesliga. Um, rehabilitation is uh, the process of returning to a healthy or good way of life. And when we are talking about rehabilitation, we also have to talk about injury. So how do injuries happen? And what is actually an injury? The definition that impressed me the most is the one from Dr. Andreas Spina. He's a chiropractor and the founder of Functional Range System. And he says, Injury will occur when the load that acts upon the tissue exceeds the load bearing capacity of the tissue. You can see this here. And yeah, this definition is pretty simple, but also pretty accurate. In consequence to an injury, rehabilitation processes should be started. Rehabilitation often only refers to returning to the same status that you've been in before the injury, but this would only kick off a vicious circle. Rehabilitation has to overshoot because there must have been a reason why you injured yourself. Either the load was too high or your body's tissue capacity was too low. 
If after an injury and rehabilitation, your life and the associated stressors are not changing, you have to be the one that changes. Otherwise, injuries will happen again and again. Already during the rehab process, progressive internal loads and stresses need to be imparted into the damaged tissue to give it information how to heal and more importantly, how to adapt. Dr. Spina also states force is the language of cells and it is obvious that after an injury and during rehab, we have to talk to the tissue and convince it post healing to increase its load bearing capacity for future injury prevention. So now coming to the practicals, um, maybe the thing that you've been waited for or not, we can see. Um, now that we've talked about the roots of musculoskeletal complaints and why they occur, I would like to teach you some practical movements so that you can stay healthy and become your best self. The way I like to teach prehabilitative movements is uh, with the controlled articular rotations, cars. Controlled articular rotations are active rotational movements at the outer limits of articular motion. They can help to understand, assess, and train human movement. They also um, are relevant for range of motion maintenance, providing signaling for tissue remodeling to allow for maximal tissue elongation and roam maintenance. As well, we can use CARS during rehabilitation, restoring articular kinesthetic awareness, neuromuscular retraining, or try to increase passive articular strength and stability. As well, um, CARS are useful for articular health and longevity. For example, um, with cartilage, cartilage has like bad up to no blood supply. It receives um, O2 and nutrition from the surrounding joint fluid by diffusion. During movement, pressure expresses fluid and waste products out of cartilage cells. When it is relieved, fluid diffuses back along with the O2 and nutrients. Coming to the um, executions of cars. Um, cars always have to be pain-free. Execution requires high awareness and you really need to focus on the particular movement. Conscious blocking of all the other body parts is needed to perform good quality cars. So let's start with some examples. Um, feel free to join and um, follow my movements. And I'm uh, always happy about feedback and how you manage to do this. So first of all, we do some cars of the cervical spine. I just start the video. You sit down straight and do a slow and controlled movement. And it's basically all the movements you can do in the cervical spine in one. It is always important, important that you avoid pain. And if you feel pain, that you make the movement smaller. Follow the movement with your eyes. So when you're going around the, the right or the left rotation, always um, go the same way with your eyes. I'll repeat it again. Um, maintain an upright torso. Stay stable with the rest of your body and don't compensate. Oftentimes I, uh, I can see that um, uh, pulling up shoulders or wiggling with the rest of the spine are ways where people want to compensate. And again, if you feel pain, make the circle smaller. Cars are always important that they are pain free. Great, okay, up to the next example. For shoulder blades, um, you can do cars as well for shoulder blades. Um, you sit up straight again, um, you extend your elbows and just try to rotate your shoulder blades up on your torso. I put this in, in all of the slides, slow and controlled movement, avoid pain. If you feel pain, make the movement smaller. This is uh, the most important thing. Try to maintain a neutral head and rotate your shoulder blades. Great. I think this is not that super difficult, but I'll repeat it again. You can make a video, or whatever. <clears throat> Great. 
great. Okay. Up on to the next one. This is a controlled ethical orientation for the whole spine. And what I really, really like with the controlled articular rotations um, is to use them as an articular screening tool. So if you do them more often, you will exactly know how your body feels during these movements. And you can feel then in comparison to all the other dates, you, you did a car for, for a certain joint. If there are some kind of restrictions or things that um, you have to work on. So I personally, I have a daily routine every single morning and um, I have a routine of cars I'm doing and I start with a spine, with a cervical spine um, car with then continue with the shoulder blade car now with the whole spine car. And um, I really have a look for my body. How is it feeling today? Um, so I can judge um, on how to how to behave, how to perform, maybe if I can um, improve something for for my work day that um, I make it as healthy as possible through through my day. Again, you flex first, rotate to the right, then do a lateral flexion, rotate again, go up into the extension, rotate to the other side. Then you do a lateral flexion, rotate again to the left, and then come in a flexed position, back to the front, and come upright again. Okay. Then a car for the shoulder joints. So I um yeah try to to demonstrate a car for all the joints that are affected the most and oftentimes um, with health issues and health discomforts. With the shoulder car, it is um, for me personally the most complicated one to um, stay stable with the rest of the body and not to compensate in other body parts. Uh, a lot of people um, try to bend to the other side of the of the moving shoulder, um, raise up their, their, their shoulder to the ear, or try to go into a really really upright position of the spine but it's really really important that you try not to to change um, the, the joint positions of, of the other body parts again the other arm is um, extended in the front so um, you can build up some tension and only focus on the arm that is moving you begin with a flexion as far as your joint is capable of then internally rotate and come over an abduction internal rotation next to your body then go back over an extension and internal rotation then externally rotate and come back over an abduction and flexion to the starting position okay and last but not least a uh, hip rotation car um yeah, you have to sit down for this. So this might be not that super practical for, um, for doing in the, in the office or in the hospital. But if you have some time left at home, you can do it. Um, it is important when you um, yeah, flex forward to the right knee, in my case, that you try to feel a stretch in the, um, in the muscles of um, your right bottom. Then you can rotate to the right and left with your spine and change into the same position just on the other side. As well, slow and controlled movement, no pain at all, feel a light stretch, maintain an upright torso, neutral spine as good as possible, rotate to the left and to the right and use your hands if needed. For some people, it is really, really hard to get into, um, in, in, in even to get into the starting position. If this is the case for you, try to put a pillow under your bottom. Uh, this can uh, make the angle for the hip rotation a little bit more comfortable. Last time, bend forward, use your hands for support, feel a light stretch. Then rotate with your spine to the right and to the left. So this is basically a combination. 
Yeah, you, you target different joints and muscle group with this one, but the hip is the main focus. And then rotate to the same position, but just on the other side and do it again. Use your hands if needed. You can place them next to the knee or on the knee. Maintain a neutral spine. Feel a light stretch. Great. And return to the starting position. So basically, this is it. Um, some take home messages for you be adaptable to your environment move more often and especially have fun with it um, and try also to focus on nutrition and relaxation so you have a, a, a good of a work-life balance as possible um, and yeah if you want to reach out you can uh, check my you can send me an email on facebook instagram linkedin i'm all over the social medias and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of my knowledge okay Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, that's yeah, very interesting. I, one topic, one thing I really was interested to hear about was the, you know, focusing more on adaptability rather than just the correct posture or the perfect posture. Yeah, this um, is basically the key. It is the yeah. key for, for um, longevity. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna open the floor for questions, but before that, I just want to uh, guide everyone to the chat box where you can see the link to next week's lecture. lecture. It's going to be about uh, stress in the workplace and burnout. So um, if anyone, if everyone who wants to be to attend next week, please sign up on the website. Also, um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please have, uh, please direct them to the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, I'll start with our first question for the night. So I think this is directed to Dr. Salman. It's from Dr. Salman Mazidi. He's also a bariatric surgeon here in Kuwait. Uh, first of all, he says, excellent presentation and paper. Uh, other than the difference in types of musculoskeletal injuries, did you find any reduction in total injuries reported with robotic surgery compared to laparoscopic and or open surgery? Yeah, uh, that's a, a very interesting question, especially nowadays. Uh, we are seeing more and more uh, this trend toward doing more robotic surgeries. Now, uh, it's really different between the first version of the robot uh, we're talking here about the Da Vinci robot. Uh, it went to different stages. So they, the robotic surgery started in the 90s, late 90s. So Da Vinci uh, went to multiple versions. So the first two versions, there was an issue with mainly with neck uh, pain and injuries. And the reason behind that is that it was not adjustable uh, well for the alignment of the back. So the robotic Da Vinci SI, uh, uh, prevented this issue, so it, uh, they made it more ergonomic, and of course the the newer version, which is XI. Uh, so, uh, but what interesting what we found with the robots that you know the the pain or injuries from other uh, parts of the body other than the neck is less than open surgery or uh, laparoscopic surgery, and the reason this is from our study. The reason behind that is that uh, when you get certified to be a robotic surgeon, uh, you will have your own posture uh, uh, made, uh, you know, fixed to the robot itself so that every time, you know, a different surgeon comes, you just have it, you know, you have to press. If, once you put your name, the posture will take place by itself. It's like when you're in the car, and you, you know, it's automated uh, and uh, the way you feel comfortable and less uh, injury. Uh, and they also, uh, you know, look into uh, posture as in, in the in, in the company from the, the robotic company. They look into this very seriously uh, to prevent injuries. So uh, that you know reduced the other injuries that we are seeing with the laparoscopic surgery and open surgery. I think with the advances of uh, research and uh, ergonomics, uh, we we're gonna have less and less injuries. Um, this is regarding the question uh, Dr. Steyman asked. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. We would definitely hope for less surgeries, with, less injuries within the surgical society. Uh, our next question is also from another prominent surgeon in Jabir, Sarah Lioha. She's, again, thanks for the great talk. 
She's wondering if you saw a difference in musculoskeletal injury between right-handed and left-handed surgeons. Also, uh, she's, she's mentioning this because since most, most instruments are designed for right-handed surgeons, wondering if instrument design had an asymmetric negative impact on ergonomics and whether this is an area for improvement. All right, so in our cohort, uh, there was a few uh, surgeons, they, they were uh, left-handed. So it's difficult to come up with a conclusion if that has impact. But certainly this is an important uh, finding that we have to look into and see if how that, you know, have an impact on uh, the ergonomics and injuries as well. I think it's really interesting, but uh, we need to uh, see, do more search on it and see uh, how that affect the surgeon if he's uh, uh, left-handed uh, compared to right-handed. But I'm sure uh, uh, this area is uh, it's been looked at at the stage uh, because we are seeing now more instruments developed for left-handed surgeons, uh, especially in laparoscopic surgery. Uh, for robotic surgery, it doesn't make much difference because uh, you can exchange uh, and the position is stable and you can exchange instruments as uh, you like. Well, thank you so much. I think this question is for Nikolai. Uh, is there any specific exercise or movements that can help out with tendinitis in wrists and legs? Interesting question. Um, uh, tendovaginitis is um, oftentimes just a symptom of uh, underlying root cause. And um, it is hard to, to give a general um, advice for movement for an exercise. Um, but what I can um, look at, what can help is try to move as often and um, moderate um, as possible in, in um, non-hurting um, areas of the joint, of the affected joint. Try to increase the, um, the nutritional, um, nutritional um, like field in the joint and um, yeah, give the joint some, some time to rest, but it is hard to, to actually say what is causing the tendovaginitis and um, yeah, always hard from, from quite a distance. Uh, thank you so much, Nikolai. Another question for you is uh, what routine of regimen, nutrition, exercise could you recommend for a busy plastic surgeon? Um, their workload, they state, is eight to ten hours a day, six days a week. Quite a lot, quite a lot. Respect to that. Um, I would recommend to um, implement movement in really in, in, in small, um, in small uh, like um, pieces a day, so that you don't um, say to yourself, "Okay, I need to, to work out for sixty or ninety minutes a day." try to implement small sessions uh, regarding movement. For example, the, the cars I just um, showed you with a, with a um, cervical, science, cervical spine car, the global spine car or uh, similar. And regarding nutrition, always important, try to eat um, as less processed food as possible. Try to focus on um, whole foods and um, yeah, um, take your time, give your body if possible some time to digest and not um, get something in on the hurry. And um, yeah, this could be something that uh, will be beneficial for, for your busy working schedule. Hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think Dr. Salman, this one's for you. Uh, you have highlighted the differences among men, men and women in surgery. How do you propose solutions to improve and reduce injuries within the same team that has differences in physicality and positions as surgery is performed in teams uh, where different people will be at different positions? All right, uh, this is an important question. I think uh, I mentioned earlier in my talk that you know, uh, we're seeing a, a, a more female surgeons are joining into the surgical field, which is really good. Uh, however, we need to accommodate uh, you know, the ergonomics and its effect on them because uh, this design of instruments where uh, it depends on the glove size, so uh, and it depends on and the height of the operating room. They take in on some sort of an average, and that has uh, also an effect. So I think uh, in the future, I think we should invest more into uh, personalized uh, uh, and more flexible OR suites and instruments that could accommodate uh, different uh, sizes. Uh, and uh, heights, and I think you know, as a surgeon, the operating room is always our house. 
and uh, we invest more into as surgeons into our and uh, and uh, studying but we don't invest enough time in the operating room and how we make it a better space for us uh, with less injuries and more better performance not from technique point of view but from a holistic approach and that's why i think you know having for example nikolai coming visiting our operating room seeing how we perform uh, and that you know might help and, you know he might notice things that prevent future injury so i think holistic approach and having you know, not one size fits all. It's an important fact that we need to make sure that uh, all these instruments could be designed uh, differently that can accommodate uh, the surgeon uh, uh, body habitus so to make sure that they don't get injuries. The worst thing we want is to have those kind of injuries. Thank you for the answer. Uh, next question is for uh, Nikolai. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk, Nikolai. Uh, you referred to one of the passive posture correcting devices. Is there anything similar in the market, a wearable or something like that, that is promising? So this is just my personal opinion. I, I'm not a big fan of these wearables because of the, the passive impact they have on your body. I'm a fan of um, active solutions. So um, I cannot recommend a, um, a passive wearing wearable, but um, what can be a possible uh, a thing that, that might can help you is um, maybe you heard of the kinesio tape. Um, there are forms of that are called memory tape. So you cross them around um, your back, for example, and the, um, the tape gives you a feeling on the skin that something is pulling you into an upright position. And this can be something that can be implemented if it's hard for you to, um, to get yourself in an upright position because the tape is like giving you, is, uh, giving you the input to, to get active. And this is something that, that I can, um, I can uh, yeah, we think is a, is a good thing for you, but um, nothing of the passive things. Thank you for that. Uh, another one for uh, Nic Nicolai. Uh, thank you for demonstrating the cars. Uh, I think this should be integrated in operating room checklists. Maybe something cons to consider sharing or adding in guidelines. Yeah, um, it's always important to check um, uh, injuries that maybe um, are, um, are that the individuals are confronted with. So if you have a history of um, maybe some some hernias or whatever. That is something that you that you have to consider first, um, and then it's just um, the cars. You can do them uh, for how, how often you want to do them, uh, for how long you want to do them. Um, I think cars are, are a great tool to do for two or three minutes. So um, you have a have a small break, give your body the opportunity to move in different positions, and then um, yeah, start to to work again. But um, yeah, checking the medical history of um, all the individuals that are. Um, affected um, by, by, the, by the try to implement this in the operating rooms um, is definitely something you have to do it before. Thank you for that. Um, Nikolai, what do you think of cryotherapy? Yeah, so um, we have a cryosauna in, in Germany in our uh, center and uh, I'm a big fan of this. Um, it is a treatment that is about one to two minutes only and uh, shocks your body with uh, a cold of minus 190 degrees. So uh, this is not something that you can stay in for a longer time. Um, and um, yeah, the, the shock is actually the thing that um, is having the benefits because your body is regulating against this the immune system um, uh, response to this um, tries to um, kind of heal itself from from this input because um, the body recognizes okay minus 190 degrees this is not something i can stay in for a longer time and um yeah the recovery can be improved um, the overall blood flow is um uh, much better after uh, a session of cross honor and um, metabolites like lactate um, especially uh, a thing that pro athletes are concerned with can be uh, flushed out more easily so i like it it uh, should not be done uh, that super often because it's um, yeah, high impact to the body so if you do it every single day there's a high chance of you getting sick but um, it is it is good in the right moments cool thank you i know you mentioned um there's no such thing as good posture uh, or more of adapt adaptability. But our question is, 
Um, do you think there's any key muscle groups that you need to do to kind of engage your body to actually get to, to the point of good posture or adaptable posture? First of all, I, I have to say that you need a good balance in your body. So there's no, nothing that you that, uh, have to, has to be trained more or less. But um, of course, for, for an upright position, the erectors of the whole spine are, are an important thing. So um, if, you, if you feel weak in, in your back area, this definitely is something you, you can work on. And, and the thing that is uh, oftentimes overlooked is the, the, the muscles of um, like the neck uh, in the front, because um, they have to hold your head all the time. And this is something um, you could work on as well. Cool. Uh, this is one question. I don't know if you want to answer this, but who's the most famous athlete you worked with? Yeah, I cannot say this now. I'm sorry for that. Um, maybe you can see some uh, on, on my Instagram, uh, one or two athletes um, uh, you can see over there because it was fine for them to, to be like um, uh, in, in public. But um, no, I, I cannot answer this. Sorry. Okay. Um, one, uh, one more, uh, two more questions. Uh, how much do you think footwear influences your posture? Oh, it has a great influence. Great, great influence. Um, I really love ba uh, barefoot shoes. Um, I wear them personally. Um, the whole... um, because the, the foot, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. My AirPods went out of battery. Um, the, because the foot is the, the platform of, of, the whole bid, uh, of the whole building, um, like called your body. And um, if you collapse down under, the whole kinetic chain with the knee and the hip and the back uh, will follow. Therefore, um, yeah, barefoot footwear or um, walking a lot of times barefoot and strengthening your foot is a, a really, really good thing. I, I recommend this. Cool. Thank you. Um, last question, I guess they're kind of similar. Uh, what are your thoughts on percussive, percussive massage therapy and your thoughts on massage guns um, to reduce DOMS? Uh, do you think they'll help after long surgeries? Um, yeah, massage guns um, do only have a, have a short-term um, effect on uh, musculoskeletal, like um, what, what you feel when you feel DOMS, it can have a short-term effect on, uh, effect on um, feeling them less, but it won't make them go away. Um, I personally don't use them. Um, I have some athletes that are using them and they feel good with them. Um, but it's kind of the same with um, the foam rollers. They um, give you some short-term relief. Um, the joints and the muscles become a little bit more movable in about 10 to 15 minutes right after um, yeah, treating yourself with the guns or a foam roller. And um, this can be something that you can use for mobilization or um, anything other that you want to do. Cool. Thank you so much. I think we, this is the end of our questions for tonight. Uh, again, I'd like to thank both our speakers, Dr. Salman and Nicola for the great lecture tonight. Um, again, I want to uh, direct everyone towards the chat box where you can uh, sign up for next week's talk. So we're going to have Dr. Jay Madoc, who's going to speak about um, having a proper stress, um, tackling stress and uh, burnout uh, in your workplace. Uh, again, uh, you see the QR code, if you could just take your cameras and, you know, uh, point them towards the QR code where you can sign up for next week's talk. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Hope to see everyone next week. And thank you to Serge Kuwait again for allowing me this opportunity and all their support throughout. Thank you to everyone and have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.